Welcome back, rich girls and boys, to the Rich Girl Roundup, weekly discussion of the Money with Katie show. I'm your host, Katie Yaddy Tossan, and every Friday, my executive producer, Henna, and I are going to dig into an interesting, relevant, well, I guess we think they're relevant, topic based on a listener question. So before we dive in this week, here's a quick message from our sponsors. Paid non-client of Betterment. Views may not be representative. See more reviews at the App Store and Google Play Store. Learn more about this relationship at Betterment.com slash Money with Katie. Investing involves risk, performance not guaranteed. This segment is brought to you by Betterment, the online investing platform that gives you the tools, inspiration, and guidance to help you and your finances stay on track no matter what's happening in the markets. Okay, Hannah, I'm excited to talk to you about this this week. I'm also, it's a little bit on my mind because we just got a random $400 charge from Geico and oh. I saw it come through on Copilot. Shout out Copilot, not a sponsor, but you should be. And <laughs> I was, so, I was Settle. like, what is this? Because Thomas got a new car. So we got a new insurance policy for that vehicle. And I finally got renter's insurance after like living here for a year and being like, oh my God, I never signed up for that. Thank God nothing happened. And then I also got an umbrella policy because I have a friend who's a financial advisor or cfp who is like you need an umbrella policy and i was like good looking out sister so anyway i've been making a lot of changes to our insurance and i saw this charge come through kind of seemingly out of nowhere and i go hey did you see this like what is this he's like yeah i don't know they texted me about that i was like okay what did the text say like what why are we being charged four hundred dollars he's like i don't know it didn't really say i was like and you're i had the exact same experience this week <laughs> You did? I was like, you're being too blase about this. I'm like, what is the password to the Geico account? I need to go be Karen in their Twitter DMs. But Truly. yeah, he was he was like super chill about it. And I was like, no, this is, we're not just going to take this lying down. I don't know what this $400 charge is for. No, that literally happened this week where my husband was like, I submitted this thing to insurance and then they didn't approve it. So, oh, well. And I was like, what do you, what? <laughs> I didn't even know we got a charge for that. Like, what are you talking about? So I'm very interested in how we're going to talk about this topic. Yeah. Sounds like we're, we're starting out on the same page. So this is, this is a question <laughs> that we get a ton, a mm -hmm. ton, like pretty much as long as I've been doing money with Katie and I've written about it. And I think we've actually done a show about it in the past. So we'll link that material in the show notes. But we thought it would be interesting to discuss because Henna and I actually approach it differently in our own lives. So this week's question boils down to how do you recommend splitting finances with your partner? Henna, do you want to read the actual cr question from Christina? Christina asked, uh, how did you and your now husband split expenses before you got married? Did you get a joint credit card assessed at the end of the month? Sometimes I want the house clean so much that I'd pay myself. I can relate. Also, there is nothing less sexy than splitting a restaurant <laughs> bill at the end of date night. Can Heard. also relate. Uh, can so <laughs> So do you want to start with your, your process? Because I think you guys have a, a really good system in place that works for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sure. Thomas and I, we lived together for a few months before we got engaged. And then about a year before we got married. So we were cohabitating and splitting bills like roommates for about a year before we were legally bound together in the eyes of the state of Texas. We've been together for about five years. The only time we've ever argued about money was in that period, that 12-month mm. period where we were doing the roommate model. And it's hard to say why, but it'd be the splitting and the, the logistics. And it was not working very well. And then once we got married, we considered continuing to do the roommate model. But eventually, I remember we were sitting at the table. We just kind of looked at each other. We're like, why are we trying so hard to make this work? Like, we just signed a contract with the literal government that we are going to be together until we die. <laughs> like, it doesn't really make sense for us to keep going the extra mile to keep all of our expenses separate because, and this is key, we had very similar approaches to money and to our goals. Mm. So we both felt comfortable combining, though we didn't do retroactive combining. So any money that he came into the relationship with, any money that I came in with, our savings and investments, we didn't go back and move money around and combine all of it into new accounts. We kept all of it separate, but from our marriage forward, the legal joining forward, we opened a joint checking account that our paychecks get deposited into, and then all of our credit cards get auto-paid from that account. 
Mm. None of my money, quote unquote, my money from my job gets shuffled into an individual account anymore and same with his with the exception of the retirement accounts that are all individual by nature and then we pay all of our bills and then everything that's left over gets invested into a joint brokerage account called tmt kgt which are our initials world domination fund (laughs) so we just like shuffle as much as we can every month into that um and it works really well for us we haven't argued about money in the almost two years we've been married since we've switched to that system and we have a joint wealth planner that we both use together and keep track of things and there's Mm. complete transparency where we're logged into the same co-pilot so we know what's going in and out but it just works for us because we both kind of have the same goals and trust and that's our show thanks everybody (laughs) here's a quick message from our sponsors we're all looking for ways to level up right whether it's finances or fitness or even fashion we all want the most roi out of life hoka's latest running shoe the clifton 9 is here to make your daily runs and workouts so much better the clifton 9s are super lightweight but they still have that cushiony feel that hoka's are known for talk about thriving plus the clifton 9 is made with a responsive new foam and improved outsole design for a whole new underfoot experience all to provide you with the support you need to maximize your runs. That's how the Hoka Clifton 9 is introducing you to a whole new standard of running. Shop Clifton 9 now at Hoka.com. That's H-O-K-A dot com. Okay, Hannah, your turn. Go. Uh, Our approach is a little different, and I've just found that it works for us in the way that we both approach money. My husband and I have individual accounts for our own emergency funds and our day-to-day savings and obviously retirement, because to your point, it is individual. Um, But we have joint accounts for shared funds and bills so Mm -hmm. for example we have like a house fund that we move money from our day-to-day savings over into each month we have Mm -hmm. we had our wedding fund we have a joint credit card for shared expenses and so that has worked for us because we've been together since I was 23 and so we just came from very different financial positions and very different approaches to money and my mom is a credit manager obviously like laser beam eyes on every cent coming in or out and I think he had more of a relaxed relationship with money so for me it was like not in a selfish way but I want to know where my money is gonna be at all times (laughs) and that I know like what it's being spent on um and you know we lived together for like four years before we got engaged so now we live together for six or seven years and so I definitely recommend having those shared accounts as your moving towards marriage. I too have always learned to just kind of keep an account for yourself in case of an emergency or if anything goes south. I understand why people suggest that you should always have access to money that is just yours. Like if something were to go horribly wrong, someone else can't take away from you. And I completely agree. Like that's why we kept our individual accounts separate was I have checking and savings accounts that are just mine. However, I think it's important to say that even though that is true from an access standpoint, God forbid, if you were to get divorced, if you do not have a prenup in place, all of those assets are likely to be split anyway. So just because something is only in your name does not necessarily mean that it only belongs to you if the marriage were to go south that is something where you are concerned going into a marriage or you're already in a marriage and you just kind of want to protect yourself and make sure that any money that's just yours stays yours like you should probably have an actual legal agreement in place it differs by state right your legal status and like how the prenup works i can't remember there's two types of states there's like um uh joint property maybe property But basically, yes, if you were to get a divorce, but you had no prenup, I'm pretty sure in that type of state, which is most, I think, like Texas is one, they just look at everything you have together and just split it down the middle. So like, even if an account is just Katie Gaddy Tossin's name, it's like, well, she came into that marriage and it became his property too. So he gets half of that or whatever. But yeah, it depends. It definitely depends. On the flip side of that, sometimes that's a positive of being able to say, okay, we split everything in half. So their assets are now half mine, but like their debt can also become part of yours. So I think that's really important to consider too. But there was also, there was a huge gap in what we were making, like compared to each other. So we would split our bills proportionally. Oh, that's nice. For a lot of things. And so if my husband was the higher earner, he would pay more vice versa. And I think, um, 
I was pretty selfish on that level where I was like, well, you make more, so you should pay more. You're like, I'm not selfish, except when it came to proportionally splitting except all of our bills. Except for that. <laughs> but at the same, well, because at the same time, now yeah. that we're like getting closer, I'm like, oh, I guess I'll split half and half. Like, I got to put my money where my mouth is. So, you know, it's funny. Wait, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but... When we were dating, I did not have a high salary um, and he was in law school and I was like, oh, he's going to out earn me in spades. So I was like priming him for like, I think proportional, it really makes sense. Like, I really think that that's a great way to do it. And then like, now that we're at a phase where I do earn more, I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, yeah. But no, but I, I do think that like, Obviously, if everything is combined, if all the money is just going into one account, it's kind of a moot point. But if you are keeping it separate and then putting money in a joint account for those shared expenses, I think the proportionality thing makes sense if the income is lopsided for sure. Because people will switch off. Like, I honestly think that throughout a relationship, like each partner will probably take turns making more. But the lower income will suppress like the quality of living or the standard of living because if they don't want to spend all of their income to try to to keep up with something that might be more affordable to the higher earner so making it proportional can help balance the scales yeah and I think to your point too like you should try to live off of one income if you can and Absolutely. go for the the lower one but at the same time I think that the circumstances that my husband and I had for where we were looking because we have pets and because of this and that and like where we had to work like I think we were sort of pigeonholed into higher income space and I think that was due to the fact that we had a job in that area or like like henna lives in the bay area I do currently uh we're gonna move back to New Jersey but I expect kind of the same thing to happen which is my husband's job is always on site my job is almost always remote and so I have more flexibility on where we end up and how low the bills can get he doesn't mm -hmm. and if he's a higher earner then I think it makes sense that he's paying to be closer to the job that he needs to go totally. for if that's something that matters to him. So we have two different approaches that work for both of us, but I, I do think it takes a lot of trial and error to figure out what's going to work because money is very sensitive. So you kind of want to approach it from all angles and be really pragmatic about what the partnership is and how you're going to approach it. Could not agree more. I mean, I think pragmatic is a great word to use because ultimately – I do agree with the kind of the jokey line at the end of the question that like there's nothing less romantic than splitting the bill at the <laughs> end of the restaurant at the end of the date. I'm like, dude, I come that was part of why I didn't like doing that because I felt it just felt so like, Ugh. but the pragmatic angle for sure that I totally am all here for is that. If you're marrying somebody or I guess just living with somebody for a long time where I think the state considered civil union or whatever it is where mm -hmm. the, you Domestic kind of are considered. Yes, you're considered married um, after you're living in the same place for so long is ultimately this is a contract with it's a it's like a business partnership. It's a contract with you, this person and the government. And even though money is not sexy and it can be very sensitive, it is so worthwhile to make sure that you are at least attempting to be on the same page and if mm. there are parts of it that you guys disagree on maybe it is best to keep things separate so that your goals are honored if you can get conceptually and psychologically on the same page it makes all the logistic logistical and tactical things so much easier because you're kind of operating yeah. from the same psychological okay this is our philosophy about money this is where we're trying to go and it just makes it f more fun I think when you're doing it with somebody else when you can really get on the same page about those goals like I know you guys are working on that house fund and you'll have mm -hmm. like meetings where you're like okay we can contribute this much to it this year and it can really be something that brings you closer too so it doesn't have to always be this like scary divisive thing but it has totally. to start with just completely open communication yeah transparency is the number one thing for us too and that's been marriage advice with someone who's only been married for a year i tried <laughs> no no no. i was referring to myself but i guess it applies to both of us I'm like i've been married oh, well. two years so same okay well we both had our pandemic courthouse weddings we did and then our expensive regular weddings. <laughs> we also did. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, thanks for listening to this week's Rich Girl Roundup. As always, we will be back next Friday. Thank you.